With your help, we can continue to fight for freedom. This is not possible without your generosity. Join our quest for the truth and our freedom. Simply visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate to make a difference today. Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week, we're going to find out what they think about the upcoming budget, which includes $153 million for up to 50 charter schools to help lift declining educational performance. And this was announced on Tuesday by Associate Education Minister David Seymour. My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Buddies. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jimmy. How are you this week? G'day, Cameron. I'm very well. Now, what's your topic this week, mate? There's a lot been happening. Well, on Tuesday, David Seymour announced that in the budget, there is going to be $153 million allocated for up to 50 charter schools. And he says it's going to help lift declining educational performances. I'm interested in your thoughts on this because you've got kids at school. I do. My kids go to private school because I hate the public school system. So I think charter schools are fantastic. I also don't like unions. I don't like having the lowest common denominator across all the board. I like individual success, and I think that teachers should be paid individually. But anyway, so charter schools are great because if people want to start a school and they've got a, you know, they could be a neglected group or whatever, then they can get funding in teachers as long as they're hitting the recognised standards. I think it's fantastic. So you honestly think it's the best policy. Yeah, it's one of the best policies. I mean, I think last week we were talking about general stuff and Paul was saying that um, the best thing to uh, to help your kids with their education is for them to actually go to school in the first place. Yeah, exactly. So if you've got a small charter school in the far north that's keeping an eye on their kids and making them turn up, it's far better than a big generalised poor-performing public school. I, I, it's just a no-brainer, especially for poor performing parts of our society to have them customise school to make them learn better. You know, they might come from harder backgrounds. And I, I think that was the real shame of shutting down charter schools last time, is that the Labour government directly shut down public sco- uh, charter schools, sorry, to, and it hurt the poorer parts of our society. And they did it just for ideological reasons. I thought that was actually terrible that, that Chris Hipkins did that. Well, they did it. They did it to pacify the teacher unions who were opposed to charter schools. And I, I've never been able to grasp the concept as to why they were opposed to it. The last time we had charter schools, I think they were saying oh, it's terrible that we could end up with some teachers at the schools that aren't properly qualified. And yet every week almost there's a story about some teacher who's interfered with some children or, or committed some acts of violence done or right. done something. And these are all registered teachers, you know, the same argument they, that the control freaks put up for having a gun register. Oh, if we have a gun register, we'll know where all the guns are. Well, we have a teacher's register, but it doesn't stop ratbag teachers defrauding people, fiddling with kids and committing all manner of other crimes. So why would it uh, make a difference no, for that? No, but char- charter schools have got some really strict KPIs they have to hit. And mm. so it doesn't really matter if the teacher's not qualified. If you've got a builder or you know someone who's been working for 50 years. Do you, want a, do you want a teacher or a builder to teach woodworking? You know, like, do you want the experience or do you just want the qualification? I, I would take the experience every day, you know. Yeah, there's that so, old saying, isn't it, that those who can do and those who can't teach. <laughs> uh, you've got all the sayings, mate, yeah. <laughs> Let's well, to piss, it, piss everyone off your saying. But yeah, that's true. Well, so charter was, schools, go out and get the experience and then teach it directly to kids and, and give these kids inspiration and direct education. And what's wrong with that? They just hate it because it's not part of the union. Why is Labour so attached to the unions? Well, they I, mean, I get it from like the 1930s and the coal mining. But what today? We've moved on, haven't we? We've moved on. I mean, no one likes a bad boss. And, you know, maybe there is a place in society for unions, but, but there shouldn't be, you know, uh, like the government uh, did the last government didn't say that we're basically bringing back compulsory unionism via stealth. The best thing that ever happened in 1990 was when Jim Bolger um, brought
brought in the Employment Contracts Act, and that was the end of the unions and the control. I remember that we had all these things like um, you know, the Mangaree Bridge that was 20 years in the building because the scaffolders would be on strike or the fitters and turners would be on strike or the welders would be on strike. It was just never-ending. Yeah, over pathetic things like the temperature of the hot water and all this and that. I, but why doesn't Labor move on from unions? Well, why do they I mean, move? It, it's why, still, do, why, do they, why don't they move on from everything? I mean, they, they they're backing the detritus of society most of the time. They're, they're not in it for everybody else. They're only in it for themselves, and um, and some vocal little groups um, that that they uh, seem to entertain all the time. Well, as far as I can work out, they're in it to protect the crumbs. You know, they spoke out about the extra jail beds. Yeah, they protect all the useless teachers. I just I think the Labour Party's lost, and, and they you want and, and they want men to have access to women's bathrooms. I mean, I don't think that's a winning election strategy, do you? Uh, well, if you're trying to win Central Wellington, it might be, but other than that, <laughs> I don't think you're going to win a seat in the South Island. No, 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 or or rural Waikato, or somewhere like that. You know. Why can't Labor defend charter schools and send them to the poorer parts of our community and fund them properly and get? Because we know through from police records that all most of the bad kids come from the same families. Like they they know all the ram raiding kids. You know, it's all the same families. You know, why can't we target them with education? You know, it'd be money well spent. That's what they rent it out, stopping it at the front end. You know, rather than locking them up. No, well, well, charter think, schools do that, and yet yeah, I think though the Labor Party has an attitude that. Uh, success is measured by how much you spend on something, uh, not on <laughs> not not on how effective that spending is, not on the outcome. So you you look at the um, you know that uh, the announcement of the bike bridge, for example, right? They, they spent you know twenty or thirty million dollars or something like that on fifty, yeah. fifth, maybe fifty million on feasibility studies, which ended up being well. This is Hopeless, we can't build it. But they announced it like it was the best thing ever. Yeah, but at that point in time, Arden was flailing in the polls, mate, and she was trying to buy everyone's votes. And it was it was just more... Uh, anyway, we're, we're covering ground that we're all bitter about. But <laughs> this week's been good. I mean, the charter school's announcement was amazing. And also Arden's Christchurch call got defunded by government. So yeah, got, we've got had a good week. She gassed the. Uh, they gassed the uh, Christchurch call. The funding, I think Winston, the public funding. Yeah, I think, I think Winston might have had a hand in that. that. Yeah, I think that would have been a little, a little bit of Winston's utu in there. I think. Well, Winston's got quite a bit of utu dishing out. <laughs> you've had you've had big bang for your buck, mate. I'll give you that for your vote buck. Yeah. Oh, I think so. Would you say that you, this is the most voting buck you've had for in your voting career? Like, well, what's national ever delivered? You know. What what have they ever delivered? No. Nothing. They're the they're the party of the status quo. The, the, all they all they like to do is manage the decline, uh, but it's a decline nonetheless. But they think that they can manage it better than Labor. So yeah, yeah they I think take you're right. And tidy it up. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. I've had a bigger bang for my buck with New Zealand First than I've ever had. And you know, every time I see Winston in the house or or speak to Shane Jones, I think, yeah, I got this one right. Winston's getting younger. I saw him in their house the other day asking Chris Hipkins what a woman is. And I just thought, oh, my God, he's getting more power. What's Jan <laughs> feeding him, Cam? Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. He's the um, happiest I've ever seen him in a long time, you know. He's up in the Pacific again yeah. do, doing another visit. He's done more visits in six months than the previous foreign minister did in six years. Well, the previous foreign minister was scared of airplanes. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> she thought she could zoom anyway, her way. That's enough for me this week, Cam. <laughs> she could, thought she could zoom her way into in, into the foreign ministry. <laughs> it's madness. All anyway, right, Jimmy. Well, that, we'll talk that, again that, next week. Thanks that, for your call. Thanks, Cam. Cool. See you. Welcome to Cam's buddies, Lindley. Good to have you back. Hello. Hey, Lindley. Good to have you back. Oh, hi, Cam. How are you? I'm fantastic. I got a bit of a. Well, that's a, good to a, hear. A, a, there's a there's a few um, a few ideas have come in on the email for your testing ideas. So 
uh, that'll be good for, good for you to, to to look up. But anyway, this week I want to talk about uh, charter schools. Mm. Now, on Tuesday, David Seymour announced that in the budget there's going to be $153 million for up to char- uh, 50 charter schools. And he says it's going to help yes. lift declining educational performance. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um well, I loved school, you know. We had a country school, and mm. we had all kids in one class, so that's probably quite unusual today. But we were exposed to several levels at once, um, so if you were a little bit bright, you could actually advance your state of education quite well. And not only that, we were under the teacher's eye the whole time. Um, things were very different and probably still are at country schools, but um, this is an absolute horror story, um, what has happened with the education today. So I would back David Seymour for trying to do something. Um, yep. He's trying to address truancy, which is one of the factors. Yep. He's trying to do something about getting some of these kids so that the teachers are actually watching them and noticing if they actually fall behind a bit and I think that's absolutely huge at school but this is how I see it really it's if you go over the history it's 17 years since the national standards policy came in yep and it's absolutely unbelievable if you actually read the history of that 17 years it's 17 years of arguing over government created task forces institutions support groups programs and the like some with impressive names and get your um, head around this one the curriculum progress and achievement ministerial advisory group 2019, and then another one which is quite current, the Curriculum and Assessment Forward Planner. Now, how do you plan backwards? Don't you just plan forward anyway, just saying. <laughs> now, exactly. 70, what? I was just saying exactly, I'm, I'm cracking up with laughter because it's... It's well, true. How do you, everyone's, you can't plan backwards, can you? <laughs> no, everyone says this nowadays, you know, going forward. What's your plan going forward? Well, you wouldn't actually expect an education uh, government outfit to come out come up with that, would you? I mean, <laughs> yeah. they're advising education, but they're coming out with a statement like that. That's the name of that group. Yeah, but they probably now, had a committee. They probably had a committee um, of ten or twelve people oh, that met weekly for six months to come up with the title. Six months would have been an absolute track record. If yeah. you go over that seventeen years, it's taken years and years just to get through a committee and, and get some recommendations. It's absolutely unbelievable. Done? And where are our net, where, done where are our standards now? They've slipped, haven't they? They got got worse. Well, I know what they are because we talked a little bit about this on a previous talk. Yeah. Um, we've got now not, uh, Chris Hipkins. Just recently, he pledged, and I like this. This is a little bit like mathematical poetry, and I think that's why I came up with it. In 2022. He pledged twenty two million. That's quite rhythmic, isn't it? Twenty twenty two, twenty two million um towards education. Well, what has it achieved? You know, you've raised the question. It's achieved ninety eight percent of decile one year ten students failed a basic writing test. Now is that thirteen to fourteen year olds? Year ten? I don't know. I've I think lost it track. is. Yeah, probably. Yes. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, anybody would lose track on this stuff. Um, 66% of students failed literacy and numeracy for NCEA. 
80% of Maori students were below curriculum by intermediate level. Now that's what 17 years of committees and groups and task forces and refreshes and forward plans and billions and billions and billions of dollars has produced. Mm. It's it's Um, shocking. It's really, really shocking. Um, But if you ask the teacher unions, if if you ask the teacher unions how we're going with our schooling, they'll tell us that we're world leaders, that we're brilliant, we're the best at this, and we're the best at that, and and it's it's all lies. Well, probably they need to go back to school, don't they? Well, they've never left school. That's the problem. No, I mean they don't know their maths. They can't they can't add up because that is absolutely untrue. You think about it, right? It's a, a, a person who's a school teacher is someone who went through the school system and they left school and went to university or to teachers' college and then they went back to school. They've never lived in the in the real world. They've only ever lived in a school of one form or another. Mm, um, I've been very fortunate to in my lifetime to come across really outstanding teachers. Um, but that I was a long time ago, Ken. I couldn't, I couldn't name one. Of all the teachers oh, really? that I ha- had, I could not name one. And I, in, in particular, oh. in, the, in the fifth form, I had a, a teacher. <clears throat> his name was Rory Barrett. And his claim to fame is that he is a leading mathematics teacher and a brilliant teacher with all these accolades and, and all of these awards. Well, let me tell you what fifth form maths was like for my class. We'd never saw the teacher. We'd have a, a, a prefect come into the class and tell us what pages of the textbook we were to do and what, uh, and what quiz in the textbook we were to do and what our homework was. And, we, and then at the end of the class, we had to hand in the homework from the day before that had been handed out, but we never saw that teacher, this award-winning mathematic teacher. And the one or two times he did turn up, he told us about how great wrestling was and weightlifting. Yes. Well, you're never going to learn that way um, because that's not the way the brain works, especially with kids. You'd just be, you'd have lost interest uh, immediately. But um, I've always had a standard um, with teachers. If you have to do homework, they're not worth their salt. Because if they teach uh, their work up on the blackboard, which is what they had, if you you watch them writing on the blackboard, you soak half of it in just watching that. Um, And you can do what they require for homework in the class if they're any good. Um, And I can identify with that because if you have to read boring pages in a textbook, a lot of of them can't even read, you know. Mm. and then go home and, and into God knows what sort of home um, and do homework and come back again the next day for the same boring uh, session, well, no, you're not going to learn. That, that, that's not how you teach people. And we spoke about that Hot House People program on another mm. phone call, didn't we? Yeah. Um, that that guy got those kids jumping out of their seats to answer questions. And, well, those, and those, those teachers are few and far between. I mean, I'll give you another example. My seventh form English teacher, a guy called, called Graham Marshall, went on to become the principal of Hutt Valley High School. In the first term, I set the exam and I got 95% for English. But he scaled mm-hmm. me down to 75% because the guy who came second in the class, who got 77%, handed in all his homework, and I never did. And so Graham Marshall scaled my marks down to below the guy who was the girly swat and handed in all his homework so that that guy could beat me. And then he wrote on my report, yeah, well, that- a splendid exam result achieved with little obvious effort. You know, all he ever did... This was the guy who was the head of the PPTA in Auckland at the time. This All that guy ever did was belittle his students. And he went on to be mm. a principal at a school, and he, and he carried on, and he's fated as a brilliant teacher and principal. And my experience yeah, of well, him was not. that he was narcissistic and, uh, and highly political and snarky and snaky the whole time. 
Yes, and, and this scaling up and down, they do it in, uh, well, do they have school cert now? I don't think they do, but um, in the days of school cert, they used to scale them up or down, de- yeah. depending on what quota they wanted to pass. And, and, you know, this is another topic, isn't it, altogether? Yep. Absolutely absurd. Um, yeah, I mean, I can identify with you because... Education is just so important, and you are at the mercy of your teachers, unfortunately. Yeah, and if the um, teachers are dolts, you know, you know, if they're absolute dolts, stupid beyond belief, and, and many teachers are, then, then they're actually a pox on the system because they're affecting the livelihoods and the futures of so many kids until finally they get railroaded out of the, out of the profession. But, but very often they don't. They carry on and have a 30-year career. And you think about that, at 30 years, they might have 10 classes of 30 kids a year, so it's 300 kids a year that they're affecting negatively. Oh, it's just absolutely appalling. I know. It's just huge, and it has a compounding effect, you know, because those kids grow up and they have kids, and, you know, then you've got a chain of kids or generations that have been affected, you know. It doesn't just affect that, that kid. It, it's absolutely appalling. I've, I've never seen anything like it. But um, there, there are other factors too. Um, I can sympathise with some teachers, but there's also this other issue of the number of teachers that are mandated out of work. And I know quite a few of them. I'm absolutely shocked how many mm. there are. And apparently they've got a mark on their file, a, a black line written across the uh, file, so that if they reapply, they're identified those are the te- as a... Those uh, are the teachers I want to um, see in schools. Those are the teachers that I want to see rewarded because they're free thinkers. They're not doing what the union yeah, well, says or they're they're doing what the bosses says. They're, they're the people who should be teaching in schools, not the, the forelock tuggers that are already there. Well, I know. Uh, that's absolutely correct. And it's the same with all the doctors and free thinkers there too. They're, they're out on their ear. But um, many of these teachers, you know, they'll never return. They've learned another way to earn a living. Yeah, they've probably and got they'll never private, go back. So. They've probably got private students um, and doing things over Zoom or uh, running a little boutique, um, you know, homeschooling type arrangement. You know, there's all sorts of things that if people are creative. That's what they'll do. Oh, I know. I, I know four of them that are in uh, a business here in Christchurch. One of them, some people know who I'm talking about, one of them, he was a senior dean at Papua New High School, a revered history teacher, a really, really lovely guy, and he was mandated out. Um, well, he and three other teachers have set up a business. They'll never go back. They are lost, and they, like you say, they're free thinkers. They can think for themselves, and they're outstanding people. They've been lost to the, you know, to the education Yeah. Um, industry, if you could call it that. But um, there are a few other questions um, which need to be raised apart from just um, starting up charter schools, and that's how the social conditions have changed, you know, over time. Mm. Um, How many kids are still taught to read at home before they go to school? Um, What about this number of autistic-related conditions? Why do they seem to be on the increase? That's another question. Yeah, very much so. What's happening there? Because they're a hell of a strain on um, mothers and fathers, um, you know, across the board. And we've got the teachers, as I said, that were mandated out of work, and a lot of them will never go back. Um, we've got the overall breakdown of the family unit, which is a huge effect on kids. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just having a, one solo parent struggling to raise them and that. Um, and then we've got truancy. Uh, so, you know, Seymour's trying to do something about that, which and creates some accountability. I think that's fantastic too, but... Will it work? Um, well, you've got, you start some, raised, you've got to start somewhere, though, Lindley. And, and what gets measured gets done. In business, if you measure something, it gets done. And, you know, well, that, had, they haven't been recording truancy 
um, stats. They've just let it all slide. And so the first step is, well, we're going to record it, and then, we, then we'll know what's happening. Then we can address it. Oh, I, I think it's a really good start, you know, yeah. I really do. But it's the same with the education, uh, Cam. You know, they, they haven't been being assessed often either, you know, because it's not, not nice to do a school report and all this sort of rubbish. Um, yeah. So it's very hard to assess how, how well children are doing as well. Well, if you go back you know, to my school... Accountability is, is out. Yeah, if you go back to my school... out, out the door. Yeah, that's right. If you go back to my school reports, I had snarky comments by the teachers, right? And 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 fair enough. And in, in some regards, I didn't do work during the class, but I didn't need to, as I was smart. Um, but these days, the reports um, don't tell you that your kid's a dopey um, student or uh, doesn't attend class or anything. They come up with all sorts of nice things to say about the drop kicks that are in the classroom at, at the moment, and so they don't actually learn. Uh, that the, the prop the, they might actually be part of the problem themselves because the teachers aren't allowed to do that because so it might you know hurt Sebastian's um, feelings or, or little Charlotte's feelings. She might get hurt and 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 you know be oh, upset know. and have to have a mental yeah. health day for, because she got a bad report. Yeah, well, it's all part of that victim philosophy, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I mean, if you go through that 17 years um, that anyone can can look at, um, the number of times they raised uh, Maori children being victims and all that, and yes, I can understand that uh, that needs to be addressed, but to constantly bang on about it um, and make them believe they are victims, that's actually counterproductive. Well, well you see that now as as young adults, you know, they've had gone through a school system that's told them they're vulnerable, that they're drop kicks, um, that mm. they need extra help, mm. that they're special, um, that they need um, a, a teacher aid, uh, that you know that nothing they do is wrong, uh, and then they go out into the real world and it smacks them in the face, and you know we wonder why there's a, a huge incidence of depression in New Zealand because reality comes creeping up on you rather fast. When you're outside of the cotton wool of the of the education system, well, it sure does. It sure does, and you've got no experience of it whatsoever. Um, it's a rude shock, even if you're well adapted. Oh, totally. Well, I thought it was anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but that, but that's what makes you your, your ability to deal with challenges. You know, if you got a school report that said. Lindley needs to try harder or concentrate more in class rather than chatting, um, then your parents would sit there and say, well, come on, Lindley, you, you know, you need to lift your game here. We're not uh, sending you to school to eat your lunch. Um, and uh, and then you, you would be shamed almost into lifting your game because you didn't like the disappointment of your parents. Well, of course, that word shame, um, you've hit the nail on the head there because when you and I were raised, we were actually controlled by shame and then it became seen as, as a terrible thing um, that sort of stifled children. But that, that was certainly how I was controlled. And so, you know, you were fearful. I mean, if you had a terrible school report, you're actually fearful to, to give it to you parents because they in turn would feel shame. They wanted you to do really well. Uh, it was a great motivator, shame. Well, you uh, know, I remember my father saying, I remember my father saying to me, if you get the cane at school, when you get home, you'll get it again. So I made sure I did. Oh, yes, I, did, I heard I that. Made sure, I made sure of two things. Either I didn't get the cane or I didn't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is right. <laughs> this anyway, is right on that note. Hiding stoop. That's right. Hiding do do teach kids. They, they teach kids to be liars. Hidings. I um, never stole well, the cookies. No. No, but hidings <laughs> also stop bullying. But anyway, you're not allowed to do that these days. <laughs> Lindley, I've got another call oh, no. coming through, so I better take that. Uh, lovely talking okay, to you again. Ken. Thanks. Okay. See you later. Bye uh, bye. Welcome to Cam's buddies, Paul. Good to have you back. How are you, Cam? I'm fantastic, as I'm always. But you know the rules on that. It doesn't matter how crap I'm feeling. The answers are always fantastic. All good. All good. Yeah. Hey, um, you might have seen on Tuesday uh, David Seymour uh, made an announcement. The upcoming budget is going to include $153 million for up to 50 charter schools. 
Apparently, it's going to help lift declining educational performance. And I know education is a bit of a bugbear for you, so I'm very interested to hear what you've got to say about this. I think that's a fantastic idea. I think charter schools, when they were last running about five or six years ago, they had a military academy type school that had many Pacifica and Maori students that were just kicking butt. They were climbing way above the norms for most schools and they were enjoying school. They had full attendance and they were achieving massive results. And then the, I think, if I remember rightly, Jacinda Ardern went and visited one of them and was presenting awards to different students for some of the amazing achievements that they had done. Mm. And then the teachers' union later said, oh, no, we're not having that because they're not part of the union. So they closed them down. And I remember thinking the only people being hurt by this are likely to vote Labour. And I thought, wow. That was like it was something that was really going well for them. The students were performing well. They were having record high attendance. And then we shut them down. And you instead, know, we thought we'd close schools down and, and the kids could go from home and with COVID and lock them up. Doesn't matter that they're not going to get sick of COVID or die from it, but they might give it to granny. So let's lock them up and make sure that no kids go to school and then they can get into the habit of not going to school, and now we've got 50% attendance, and the performance would be way down at that level. So I think having these charter schools open up again is fantastic. But the problem I see is if the government changes within the next nine years, and it probably will, no one does three terms well, Mm -hmm. the third term is the last for sure, in the fourth term they don't get there. So if that happens and the Labour government comes back in and shuts these same schools back down, um, you can only take so much of um, spending all the money and effort and all the things and having plans for um, a school and then have it shut down by the following government. I thought you'd need to somehow put in an irrevocable clause to stop, you know, if they're performing well, to stop them being shut down. But again, they can change the rules of what performing well looks like. And I, I imagine they can shut you down anyway. But that's the, the thing that would stop me from rushing out and becoming a charter school is paying your government and they shut you down. Yeah, I mean, I think the last time uh, it just took too long to get them established. Um, and it meant that they'd only been in place for about 18 months when when the Labour government came in and it was easy for them to disestablish it. And I think David Seymour's probably learned from that and ensured that uh, there will be a large body of charter schools, not eight or nine, but 50 charter schools. And that's a whole lot of happy parents that will kick up an absolute stink if anybody tried to shut it down and having it in place in the first term of what's what could be a, a two term or a, or a three term government is probably a more sensible approach. But you know, I was, think, I was thinking well, you were mentioning the- about the teachers' unions, and you said that you know they they didn't want the want the schools. And I think one of the things that they said the last time we had charter schools is they didn't like the idea that you could have somebody teaching a class say, on welding, who wasn't a trained teacher. And I would have thought that someone who was a a really good practical welder, and, you know, you and I know a couple of people that are like that, would be a better person to have in the classroom uh, teaching kids how to use welding equipment than someone who's been to teacher's college for three years. Absolutely. I remember when I was doing my trade cert in um, telecommunications and they were talking about a particular facet and the instructor clearly had never been on the job doing this facet of work Mm. because what he said was so wrong and and I went and saw him afterwards and I said, "Um, what you've just said there is completely wrong, which shows you've never done it before. So everyone that has done this job knows that what you're saying isn't true. But this is what happens and, and he had egg on his face and he said to me, well, thank goodness you didn't mention it in class, but I'll straighten it up tomorrow. And so the next day in class, he retaught the subject with the correct information. And it was all I could do not to call out in class, but 
what back to the the thought that they um the the day that uh, David Seymour has thought about I see that he's giving ten year contracts to operate oh, these the charter schools with two rights of renewal for another ten years, making a maximum or minimum like a thirty year term yep. if you don't muck up. Sounds so like I a think good idea. That might be something that he's done to to offset that, but that's something that needed to be done. And you need to, and and they're also saying there also that you have to. They're going to do a hero review, which is the education review office reviewing the sort of curriculum and the way the kids are going. But every time I've had an um, ERO review of the school, the things that they were mattering, which mattered most of them. Now the school that I'm on the board of is, um, I think it's got two or three European students and out of the mm. 350 kids that go there and the rest are Pacifica, Maori and I think Philippines at the moment are, are starting to go there a bit. But um, the Eero report was more interested in what we were doing for Maori and how we were doing it for Maori. And it took them a while to get their head around that our Maori students were outperforming other Maori students all around the country and our Pacifica students were outperforming other Pacifica students around the country and our kids in general, were in the top schools and so that, that they would compete with um, claims and grammar and all these sorts of things. And so that I was trying to say to the Euro people, are you sure you're worrying about the right stuff? Because whether <laughs> yeah. we have got safe spaces for Maori was less important to me than the performance that the kids were getting and how well they were doing. Yeah, and so, ex- um, exactly. I see... Um, in this, they're going to be requiring Euro reports, but I think the Euro needs to get their head around what the charter is so that they can measure it against the charter rather than a set of rules that yeah. they've said uh, sort of woke and likely to keep you broke. I see that um, David Seymour wants to convert 35 state schools to charter schools. Your school might be uh, such a school that might be um, might be able to avail themselves of of that funding. Um, and we will look into it for sure because there's some um, things there that would um, that, like you can do a lot with money. You can do a lot, and mm. it's a matter of how. Like part one of the courses that we do for um, our students is teach them in year twelve and thirteen how to drive and get a driver's license yeah. so that they've done all the requirements to get their license. And many of our students have a driver's license. And um, I had a business that was renting cars to people and many of them would come in their twenties and thirties without a driver's license that was legal to drive by themselves. They might have a blue learners or a yellow restricted, but few had the green full license and we're trying to get these kids that step on that run so that there's other things that they can do but we're also getting a lot of them passing university entrance which of course is we want them to be lifetime learners like lifelong learners so that you're always learning is really the love of education is what what it's all about yeah exactly i mean i know from discussions with you privately that you are always constantly learning new things. Always, uh, you have an inquisitive mind. Uh, and most of the blokes uh, that that we have at lunch are inquisitive people, wanting to learn new and different things. Um, that's why we're good at what we do because we're constantly learning and improving. 100%. So you yeah. know, and, and you, you're right. Last week, I think you said that the one of the biggest problems we had. Uh, was that the kids are simply not going to school. If we can just get them to go to school, that's, that's going to help them no end. Absolutely. Attendance is was the first problem. And then making the curriculum interesting is the second problem. Like I've had teachers report to me on the board mm. in monotone telling me what the, the department has achieved. And I've said to them, look, this is too much for me. If you're as interesting to the children as you are to present this report right now, I wouldn't be at all surprised if many of the children have just switched off and gone to sleep. You need to lift your game, man. And and like people are saying how rude and how harsh I am. But if you can't report to the board in an interesting manner, then you're not worth, um, you know, like how are you trying to keep the interest of 
young minds, you know, and especially well, young men. That's what I said to Lindley. I said the problem we've got in the school system, and it, and I reca- uh, recounted to her some of the things teachers had said to me in my reports, and you know I just laughed them off at the time because I thought the teacher was stupid, and he was. But uh, but he said the things that I needed to hear, uh, and sometime after I left school, uh, and you know in between there and my kids going to school and your kids going to school. All of a sudden, you couldn't tell kids that they were um, that they were a little bit thick, or they weren't trying hard, or they weren't attending school, and so they would be sent home with these reports that would wax lyrical about some uh, something that the kid could do well, uh, but not actually about the things that they didn't do well. And so they've gone through the schooling system thinking that it's all happy hockey sticks. They've left school, and in reality has smacked them in the face and once they've started to work and they get told that it's substandard or you need to try harder or um, look, you best not darken the door of this office anymore because you're not fit for for a man or beast in any sort of uh, occupation within the uh, confines of this building. And they've never been told that before and it's a real shock to them. What I've found with a few of them because I've been mentoring some young men in a young enterprise group Mm. That they they rock up to their fortieth interview and they're not even getting a reply. And I was saying to them, in many cases in life, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So go and see these people, and here's something that can go with you and say, um, and so at least you get an interview and a reply. And suddenly, some of these folk have got jobs. And I'm saying it's a tough, tough system out there. But unless you're starting to become the best of the best with your report and the best of the best with your schooling, unless you can dress yourself properly and look the part and then ask intelligent questions of your employer, why would he employ you as opposed to the other 50 applicants? And clean and your damn shoes. Some of these guys have... <laughs> yes, and, and have clean shoes, 100%. And, and these guys are all looking and thinking that what are you on? And then they give it a go and then they're coming back and saying, oh, can you help me here? Can you help me there? And so I'm helping them with their resume so that when they go there, it's catchy and it's got some points in it that might make an employer say, this guy's worth taking a risk on. I mean, if you get someone turn up to an interview and yes, they've got a tie on and they've got a jacket on, but they haven't uh, tie, you know, tied their tie with a Windsor knot, and their shoes are scuffed on the toes, and the trousers aren't ironed, and the jackets are skew and got dandruff all over the shoulders. You're not going to employ them, are you? You're less likely, absolutely. And if some, it's like the story where the bloke um, gets this suit made for him by a poor tailor, and it's got one arm holding up this way and one leg crooked that way, and another bloke go walks past and says. See, that Taylor's done an amazing job. Imagine trying to fit that bloke. But <laughs> some people make a good suit look like rubbish. And so it's a matter of the, the first thing you have to do is learn how to dress yourself so you look a bit corporate. And the people that can succeed often and the people that can't wonder why. Well, the, it's the old saying, you know, those who can do and those who can't teach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not in charter schools. <laughs> no. And on that note, Paul, i better go to Jack. He's waiting uh, on the line. And uh, we'll talk again next week. All good. Take care. Bye for now. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jack. Good to have you back. Thank you. How are you, Cam? I'm good. What about yourself? Uh, I've been better, but I'm okay. Yeah, that's good. At your age, every day above ground is a good day, isn't it? You go to more funerals than you do weddings, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, did you see the news on Tuesday that the government is uh, going to provide $153 million in the budget so that they can set up 50 charter schools, 15 new ones, and convert 35 state schools to charter schools? And I'm interested in what you think about that. Well, of course I did, because I'm a newsaholic. Um, well, <laughs> Firstly, I think that education is the key to everything in society if you want to succeed. And we've got two problems, I, I believe. 
The first is that we've got far too many people going to university when they could be in more productive sectors of society. And secondly, a worse problem is we've got far too many people that aren't getting any education at all. And when I look at, I don't know much about the charter schools, but when I look at what I do know is that they seem to have a military aspect of it. And I like this because when I was educated way back in the late 50s and early 60s, New Zealand had, well, they did in the South Island anyway, uh, they had a, a military aspect to the program and that the first two weeks at uh, high school, you were in the military. You had military uniforms. You went out, you learned military stuff. You learned how to shoot rifles and um, how to do all sorts of stuff that the army did. And I loved it. And then, then every Wednesday, you would have more military stuff. It, Wednesday afternoon was devoted right through uh, every year to military training. I bet you and enjoyed brain gun practice. I I've already told you, but uh, for your listeners, <laughs> that's that's another time that I got six of the best when caning was allowed. Um, and it was my turn to shoot the bring, and I think we were at 300 yards. And uh, we were told to uh, only fire in bursts of three, otherwise we'd overheat the barrel. Yeah. And just at the moment I began, when, when we got the command to shoot, no headphones, of course, in those days, hence the reason I'm now deaf as a post, a hare just happened to pop up the hill, <laughs> uh, and everyone said, get him. And so I remember watching this trail of shots going up after the hare as <laughs> it was gallivanting up the hill, and I let the whole 27 rounds go, for which I received six of the best, and quite rightly so. I don't think I ruined the barrel, but whatever. You don't ruin And you're going to ask, the, the, did I get the hare? Yeah, did you get the hare? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was I was so intrigued with the trail of the bullets, you know, leaving dust marks that went up. I was I just loved it, and I just <laughs> followed it up there, and I didn't have the heart to actually shoot it. <laughs> the, the the only thing better than magazine fed automatic weapons is belt fed automatic weapons. Yes. Yeah. Well, but, I don't yeah. think the bring gun is belt well, mechanism. The, yeah, the bring gun. It, see, the thing is, is they're designed to take about um, 200, 250, 300 rounds before you change the barrel. But they came with two barrels. Yep. And designed to do that takes you all of about 10 seconds to change the barrel on a Bren gun, and you drop the hammer again yes, and let, let, loose, let loose the next 30 rounds. Yeah, well, I know everything about, well, I knew everything about the Bren gun. I'm a bit out of practice at the moment, but after five minutes of instruction, I'm sure I'd be as good as I ever was. But anyway, getting back to the charter schools, I don't know much about them, but I love the concept. And hey, what the heck? It's better than what's happening now because, quite frankly, the education system in this country is not good. No, it's not good. And so, you know, uh, anything that, in my book, that upsets the unions, especially the teacher unions, and anything that upsets yep. the Labor Party is a good policy. And charter yeah, schools anything fix that. Anything that says that all teachers are equal to other teachers, teachers, we all know, when we look back, who the good teachers were. I can remember a name the few teachers that were so good. And I can't remember for the life of me the bad ones. Oh, I remember the bad ones, and I can't name a good one. But I remember the bad ones oh, really? for sure. Oh, yeah. But, I, I mean, maybe I just had a bad bunch of teachers. But, you know, going to one of the best schools in New Zealand, you would have thought they were better than they were. But my experience of, of teachers was mostly they were stupid. My first teacher I can remember was Mr. Bock. Now, I think he was the grandfather of um, the cricket um, Stephen guy. Bonk. And, in fact, and I remember seeing that guy, um, cause, but I also, um, when he was a child, but Mr. Bock, I can remember, he came back from World War II. We learned all the songs that um, they knew in the Army, and he was just a great inspirational teacher, and I remember it to this day. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I remember uh, one teacher I had at school, and he was in bomber command in World War II. So, you know, yep. they were actually, th these blokes that were teaching us back then were proper blokes uh, that had done manly things. Yes. And uh, yes. you, if they said they were going to cane you, and they did, you knew about it. And you and you started to think, well, you know, yeah, I'm not really kind of keen on that. Um you know, with the with the whippy canes and the strong forearms, or back back, you know, the backhand if they were particularly good at it. 
um, and you learned uh, don't do stupid things, otherwise you get caned. Yes. Yep. So you you never let off twenty seven rounds in the Bren gun again, did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> there you go, fast learner. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, hmm. All right, Charter Schools is Great a big time. plus from you, Jack. Excellent. Yes, sure is. All can't, right, well, we'll talk be, again next any week. Any worse than what we're doing now? No, we can't. We can't do any worse than what we're doing yes. now. Yes. All right, we'll talk again next and week, peace, Jack. Thanks peace. very much. Okay, good to, good to hear from you. Bye. Okay, see you. The current school system isn't delivering, and I think Charter Schools could be the way to go. And so do my buddies. Tell us your thoughts on Cam's buddies by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thanks for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. Do you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to? Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We'd love to hear from you, so connect with us today.